Okay guys, now it's part two. We're out of the shooting range and we're gonna be shooting my 50 caliber mountain rifle. Now, how to start? Well, you've got the bore where you can run a patch up and down it and it seems to be okay. Cock the gun. Make sure a gun is unloaded when you get there. I didn't discuss that before. So let's look at that right quick. <coughs> When you take the ramrod out and put it in the gun, it should go all the way to the bottom. See how short that's sticking out like that? But what you want to do is measure it. Put your thumbnail where it's at the crown, pull it out, and lay it up here and make sure it goes all the way back to there. So as you can see, that's about where the breech is. There isn't anything in it. Also, take it and shine a flashlight down there and look to the side of it and make sure there's nothing in it when you get it. About 50% of all muzzle loaders are going to be loaded when you get them. Just be prepared. Okay. You have also made sure it's unloaded. There's no plug in the nipple. And when I had mentioned about putting a toothpick in the nipple, leave it long. Don't break it off flush. Leave it sticking out like a half inch. So I got something I can grab a hold of and wiggle with and pull out. Okay. Now I should be able to blow into the end of the barrel and hear air whistling out down here. That means that the air channel is complete. If you can't get air to come out, a flash can't get in. Don't try loading it until you clean it out. <clears throat> if it's not working, unscrew this nipple. They make tools for it, but a small pair of pliers, real tightly fitted, will work and just unscrew it. And then run something like a pipe cleaner in there or something and go back and do it. Now on this one, you've got a screw right there. Those are normally just rust welded in place. What you can do, remember when we were soaking it in oil, if it did not have to go through that step, you can turn it like this and put oil into that drum so that it goes straight down and pulls on the other end of that screw. That screw is designed so that you can run in straight line all the way across into the hole back there and clean it out. So I'm coming this way with like a 30 caliber cleaning brush and actually sit it down in that hole down there, the powder chamber, and clean it out. And I can come in from the side and clean it out as well. Okay? But you've got the gun where air goes through, it's ready to shoot. Alright, where do we start? First, don't use uh, substitutes in a flintlock, like Pyrodex, 777, stuff like that. It would give very erratic ignition. It may go, it may not go in a flint lock. In percussion guns, you can shoot Pyrodex, Triple Seven, and the substitute powders because it's a hotter flash in a more focused area, like a primer, and it will go easier. Okay. Black powder is a class A explosive. Smokeless powder and all the substitutes are, substitutes are a class C flammable, which means they do the same job, but they're not nearly as sensitive to flash and things like that. So that's one of the reasons you need to stay away from in a flint lock. In a percussion gun like this, they're okay. So what type of powder? Well, 50 caliber and below, you can use triple F. You can use it in the bigger ones as well, but it, it, you start reaching a point of diminishing returns, okay? So if it's like a 60 caliber or 75 caliber brown bess or something like that, again in flintlock, then you're probably going to want to use 2F powder. Just seems to be more consistent in the big bores. And big shotguns like 12 gauge and stuff, usually 2F is what you're using. But if you've already got a percussion revolver, you're already using 3F, you can use that in a 50 caliber muzzle loader, something like that. Okay. Projectiles. If it's a 50 caliber, it should be a 490 round ball and then a thin patch. We talked about that in the last one. <clears throat> if it's had a really rough bore, get you a handful of like four or five ones that go into a cabin ball revolver that are way undersized and use a thick patch and shoot them to beginning. That's what I've done with this. I've already shot 30 rounds through it the last time I came out. And I shot with that to kind of lap the bore. Any roughness, get it out. Now it will get rid of stuff that's standing up, like rust, but it will not get rid of pits. 
compensate. A pitted bore can still shoot accurately. It just fouls quicker. A rusty bore will never shoot accurately until you get it smooth. Okay? So I've got the rust out of this. I've got it smooth, but I've got some pits, especially up near the muzzle. And we're going to see how that affects the accuracy of it. So, how much powder to start? Well, a good rule of thumb is start with whatever the caliber of the gun is. So, a 36 caliber squirrel rifle, start with 30, 35, maybe 40 grains of powder as a starting load. A 50 caliber, start with around 50 grains. And then go up or whatever till you find the sweet spot. Now, usually somewhere between 50 and 65. Sorry for the wind, guys. You're going to, being at the range, you're going to hear people shooting. You're going to hear aircraft, and you're going to have wind today. I'm sorry for it, but can't help it. And uh, <clears throat> using 50 grains to start with, and then somewhere between 50 to 65 is usually the sweet spot for a target load. Okay. To get a hunting load, you'll go on up to 75, 85, or maybe even 90. Okay. The biggest load of a gun I'm, I'm aware of proofed is 110, and that's a real heavy breached, like a John Browning mountain rifle that was sold by Browning. And those are the barrels are like one and a quarter, where this is just one. It's a bigger barrel. But somewhere in the 75, 80, you're just going to have to trial and error like anything else. But we're going to start out with 50 grains. All right, let me turn this around. We're going to set up the loading process. Okay. I've got the gun wiped down so there's no excess lube in the bottom of it. I've got a range rod. That's just a rod with a rammer on the end of it. And it's got a bore guide. This is a piece of brass that keeps you from banging up the rifling on the end loading. It protects that. I'll show you that in a minute. <clears throat> All right, I have a flask of 3F black powder. I have some patches that are pre-cut. I've got a rag for wiping. I've got a container from my old muzzleloader days that I handmade that's got 50 caliber round ball that I cast in it. I've got some pre-made up charges ready to go. I got percussion caps, I got lubricant, a short starter, and we are ready to go. Now, if you're loading in the field, you're going to use the same rod that's on the gun. But I'm not going to be doing that because I'm at the range and I have a range rod. For my pre-made ups, what I did was I took my Dixie tubes that I use my percussion 44 caliber and they will hold 50 grains and then I just stick a wad in the end of it like goes in a percussion revolver to hold it. So, squeeze it, pop that out, pour the powder charge down the barrel, making sure that all of it did go. Now, give it a pump to settle it all the way to the bottom. Now we're going to take a patch something good, soft, and thin. And that's what this is. I'm going to take my knife and I'm going to cut the patch size out. Now you can have pre-cut patches like I have in there. Or you can what we call cut on the muzzle. I'm going to, for this exercise, cut at the muzzle. That means force it down in there and then cut it off to make sure it's right and proper and tight fitting. Alright. So I'm going to take my lubricant and I'm using gun butter. I'm going to get the edge of that good and wet with it. 
Now this is just tight weave, 100% cotton. And it needs to be tight because the patch is not truly a seal. What the patch does is it grips the ball and allows the ball to grip the rifling. Remember, this rifling, I mean, this ball is actually undersized. Even if it's 490, it's undersized. And if you could just drop it down the barrel, it's undersized. So when you fire it, it kind of rattled down the barrel. The patch grips it and takes up that slack. It also holds it in place so that whenever I load the gun, should I happen to point the muzzle down or whatever, it will not accidentally let the ball and powder roll apart. See, I've draped it over the top. I'm going to take the ball with a sprue. That's where you had it in the mold, and there's a little pickup on the top of it where it cut off. Point that straight up. I'm going to set it up there, and I'm going to start it down my finger. And I'm going to use a short starter. Short starter has a little nub and then a short end. Put the nub up there, give it a little bump. Get it started. And then just get it started down the barrel. So it's a, maybe a, that far down the barrel. Now I cut it off using the muzzle as a guide. Don't worry, it doesn't have to be perfect. Now I put the rammer up there, drop that protector up there, give her a little push, and take her all the way down to the bottom. When I get to the bottom, bring the rod up and give it a little tap. That tap's going to flare the ball out just a little bit, make it, that patch fully bite into the rifling. That's what we want. Now, I'm going to use my revolver capper. Let me get it set up and we'll be aiming at the target and then I'll cap it when I get it on the bench. Okay, now I've got my bench at the proper elevation where when I look down the sights it's naturally straight on the center of my target. I have a bench where I can rest both elbows down to stop any wobbling or whatever. Put it on the center of the target, make sure everything's aligned, breathe normally, and when you're saying, no, okay, that's about it, hold your breath, make the final alignment, and pull the trigger. From the time I start to hold my breath till the time I pull the trigger should be around five seconds or less. After that, your eyesight starts getting blurry. So sitting there holding your breath for 30 seconds, lining up the sides, your eyesight's getting blurry. So, we're going to cock it, set trigger, hold hammer, Cap it. We are now live and hot. Seat the gun into the shoulder. Head straight up. Looking down the sides. Exactly where we want to be. Okay. Pull the cap off, make sure she has fired, everything's good. Run, up and down, make sure she's empty and kind of blow some of that soot out. Now in the past, we would blow down the barrel and see smoke come out down there and tell us that touch hole was still clear. That's not done on ranges anymore because they're scared in a big group Everybody go bang, you thought your gun went and it didn't, and you got your face over it blowing when it did go. So don't be doing that. Now, I'm going to simply reload, identical to what I just showed you, three times. Actually, I take that back. I'm going to do it five times. Why? Because of flyers. I don't know what this is doing. So I'm going to aim at exactly the same point on the target. And I'm going to shoot five times. I ain't going to go down there and look. I ain't going to chase no bullseyes. 
And what chasing bullseyes mean is I shoot, and let's say the bullet hits at the seven o'clock position. I mentally want to kind of turn it up a little bit more to two o'clock, kind of, you know, uh-uh. Aim at the same point, get a group. We can then adjust the sights to move the group. But till I get a group, you don't know where you're going. So shoot five times, then we'll go down and look at that target. I'll be back with you. Okay, we've now shot five times down range. Now, something I didn't touch on, but I want to touch on right here. You go to put the lubricant onto the patching material, either pre-cut patches or like I was doing. Don't just smear a little on the top. Get it on it, and you want to smear it into the fiber. And I'm going to show you what that means in a second. I get a little gob of it like that, and then I want to fold the material over and kind of grind it. So it goes through the fibers, not just laying on the surface, it's in, uh, into the actual surface. And that makes a difference because you got, remember, the job of this patch is to, when the, the fire happens, it's going to run around it through the rifling, the bottom of the riflings. The patch's job is to grip the ball and grip the walls of the rifling and impart the spin. It's a sabot. So that when it comes out the end of the muzzle, it lets go. And it lets the ball spin on. Now, yes, the ball will be impregnated with the rifling where it does drag. But this is what keeps us from having to take a full-size ball and beat it down the barrel to make it engage the rifling. This is the, not the right word, gasket, but it's the seal that goes between them. But it's not a true gas check. The fire's still going to run past it. It's going to run around the edges of the... Um, rifling and go past it. And you'll see that on the patch. Now, we have fired five times. Now we're going to walk down range to look at our target, but we're also going to pick up the patches. Those are important. And we're going to read the patches. So let's do that right now. Right here, is the patch for the one I just shot. Right there. Now when you hold it up to the light, you can see all the way around where all the rifling is. You see holes. Like you went dot 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 dot. That's the gas blowing past. But what it doesn't do, so that's the side that was facing the fire. It's not burned through, it's not torn to pieces. The edges up here are frayed. That's where the gas blows by it. But what's important is this circle right here where it was up against the ball is not torn and there's no big tear, okay? Now if I looked on this and one half of the patch is torn on every one of them, that tells me that I've got a, a rough spot in the bore that as it's running along it kind of grabs it uh, and it tears the patch. And that means a big loss of pressure and it can cause the patch to kind of roll out of the way and the ball roll down bare metal and cause accuracy issues. But you want it to be a full 360 circle like you're seeing there. So it's wrapped around the ball and it's doing its job. Now let's look at the target. Okay, that's one, two, three, four, five. Three in one hole right there. Basically one hole. Get you a better view of it. Sorry for jerking y'all around so much. So there's three right there through one hole. And I got two others. These first were my first ones. Now I was aiming here. So I'm a little bit low and slightly, not much, but just a grunt to the right, okay? But still, let's look at that. That's not even a palm of the hand. That's about three inch circle or less at 25 yards. Yeah, but Blake, that's only 25 yards. True. But let us be real world here. I live in very, very dense woods where most archery shots are 25 yards or less, usually very less. 
most shotgun shots in the thick cover are 25 yards or less because beyond 25 yards you can't see anything because there's so much in this semi-tropical jungle I live in you can't see a deer at 30 yards because there's too many things between you and it you see like a foot and maybe an ear but no target so right now could I take that gun and sit in a deer stand in some of the two dozen places I could call out where I would have a 0 to 30 yard max target in very dense cover. Yes, I could hunt deer with that right now without having to make any adjustments because that is the vital of a deer. And I could easily just adjust the size to there and be on it. So could I hunt with it? Yes, I could put three through one hole. So therefore, it's coming back. Now, I want to extend the range out to 50 or 100 if possible. That's going to take a little time and patience. Now I need to do load development because remember, this is just flat 50 grains. I've done no load development, period. So what has this shown me? What's this target tell me? Here's my aiming point, a little bit low and a little bit left, a little bit right, excuse me. So I need to drift the sight just a skosh to line it up like that. And I need to go up in my powder charge just a little. So we're going to step back and we're going to try a load a little bit more. Now this was 50 grains, flat 50 grains. Let's go up to 65 grains and aim at the same target. Don't change sights and let's see if it moves the point of impact up and be closer to target. I'm betting somewhere around 60, 65 will lift it up just a little bit more, shoot it just a little flatter and get it there. So let's try that right quick. Okay, here's what we got. I'm running out of light, so I have to call it quits for the day. But I went ahead and went up to 65 grains, and this is what I got. These two are already there. So I got this, this, and this. A little bit of string. And see how it brought the elevation up? So 65 put it up here, and I really felt that I kind of fudged that one a little bit. So I figure it should be right in here, which is closer to it. So somewhere in the 65 range or something like that is where it's going to be happiest for it doing a shoot. So, what we've learned is, one, the barrel can still be accurate. At least accurate enough for deer hunting. I'm not going to win any matches with it. But at the same time, I can easily stay on minute of deer. And I've used that term before, of minute of deer, minute of hog. I have got some <laughs> cold day and it feels like you've got caterpillars up your nose. Just why? Anyway, whenever this whole page is the size of a vital on deer. Okay? So as long as I'm grouping my group somewhere in the middle of that page, I'm okay. Now what I'm seeing from this is, A, I need to adjust my sights to bring them over and bring my sights up. It's dead to the bottom and that front sight is a little bit crooked on this one. Where obviously it got dinged up at some point. And this is something you want to look at. Look at that front sight and make sure it's straight up and down. And this one obviously is not. It's actually the blade's kind of bent. So I'm going to need to pick a player take a pair of pliers and very carefully straighten this out because I think it's putting a little English on me. Likewise, that rear sight needs to come up just a grunt to make this work out, okay? So, or I might need to file down that front sight to bring it up, either way. But the point is, this gun that was for all intents and purposes dead that my friend Dan said it'd never shoot again. But with time, patience, a little bit of know-how, I brought it back to where I can use it. She is still going to be able to go to the hunting range. She's still going to be able to go to the hunting field, but at close range only right now. I certainly wouldn't want to take her out and try to do a 200-yard shot across the field with her but my eyes ain't that good anymore anyway. So going to the places that I'm thinking of going down near the edge of the swamps where it's 
thick, thick cover where that deer's gonna be walking out at anywhere from 15 to 20 yards. And that's the only shot you're gonna have because you can't see it any other way. You just gotta listen real close and hear him coming. And that way when he steps out, you're ready. This will be more than reliable enough for that. And so she gets to go back to the field. I hope you've enjoyed this video, guys. There'll be more videos later on on the muzzleloading rifle if you like it. If it doesn't do well and people just go, nah, I really don't care. I'll move on to another topic. But so many of you have asked me to look at muzzleloaders and rifles. And so if this does do well, if you hit that like, share, and subscribe button for me, I'd appreciate it. Then I'll roll over and do my flintlock next time, and we'll talk flintlocks. Can't tell you much about inlines other than basic muzzleloading because I don't shoot them modern newfangled guns. I shoot traditional guns. Hope you enjoyed the video, guys. Till next time, guys, I'm Blackie wishing you safe journeys. Have a great day, guys.